Hello? My name is Shrina P. Kad. I'm the department head for mechanical aerospace engineering here at NC State. Uh, welcome to the annual Hassan Distinguished Lecture. We're glad all of you showed up on such a day with all the rain. Uh, appreciate your presence here. We have a pretty interesting topic, of course, uh, timely, and so and we are uh, thankful to Ben Murphy for accepting to come and give us this lecture, and also because Boom is going to be a neighbor soon, uh, and uh, it's exciting for the state of North Carolina to have Boom here. So thank you again for you guys. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to have a moment of silence because we just got a news that we had a, a loss of a student yesterday. Um, so just just a, a second of silence for the loss of a young student. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So we also here to celebrate the life of uh, a stalwart in our department. Many of you might not know, but Dr. Fred DeJarnett was a, a looming figure in our department for a long, long time. And, and uh, he's retired for a few years, but he passed away this past year. And we want to uh, do a short remembrance. Plus, another great interesting fact is Dr. Hassan and Dr. DeJarnett were very connected. Uh, so it's appropriate, we thought, that to remember him at the Hassan lecture. So I'm going to request Basil to come and say a few words about uh, Fred DeJarnett. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Basil Hassan. I'm from Sandia National Laboratories uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a three-time grad of the aerospace program here at North Carolina State. I'd like to thank you all for joining us in person, as well as those of you who are online today, uh, for the Dr. Hassan A. Hassan Distinguished Lecture. Uh, this lectureship commemorates my father, who spent more than 56 years on the faculty uh, as a professor, professor in aerospace engineering here at North Carolina State. Uh, he started in 1962 uh, until he finished his phased retirement in uh, um, 2018, shortly before his death in, in January of 2019. Um, he played a huge role in starting the aerospace program here uh, in the early 1960s, uh, creating a legacy for what it is today. Uh, I want to thank all of those within the department who have made this lecture happen over the years, uh, uh, which was started in 2015 when my father started his phased retirement. So in particular, several people who are in the audience today, uh, Professor Mohammed Zikri, uh, Professor Rich Gould, Professor Jack Edwards, uh, Srinath as the current department head has continued to shepherd it, and uh, our former NCSU development director, Mike Walsh, uh, as well as many former students and faculty and others who helped contribute to endow the lecture. Um, for those of you who uh, have been uh, able to see the lecture over the last few years, they are all on YouTube, so if you want to go back and and see, uh, and see some of the great talks, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, as you can read in the bio, uh, my father uh, was really dedicated to the success of this department. Uh, its research, its contributions to the aerospace profession, and more importantly, the success of the students. Um, in addition to the legacy created by this lecture, he has also supported the department in very different ways, including endowing uh, some graduate fellowships, both through the NC State uh, Foundation, as well as uh, the American Institute of Aeronautics of Astronautics, which I had the pleasure of being its president for the last two years. Um, he also has endowed a distinguished professorship, which we hope will be able to be filled sometime in the next year. So today, um, we want to take a few minutes to recognize his longtime friend and colleague and partner in crime, Dr. Fred DeJarnett, uh, who passed away earlier this spring. Uh, Dr. DeJarnett was also a longtime member of the aerospace faculty, as well as being a fellow of AIAA. Uh, coincidentally, today's lecture is on the topic of supersonics, and that's where um, Dr. DeJarnett 
spent a lot of time uh, in his life uh, working in those areas. And so even though I've known Dr. Dejernet for most of my life since I was just a little kid, um, right after I graduated uh, with my PhD, he insisted that I call him Fred. He says, you're a colleague now, you will call me Fred. And I just said, that doesn't seem right because I've always known you as Dr. Dejernet. So, um, so anyway, while it does seem a little bit weird, I will call him Fred for t the rest of the day just to, to talk about some of the things that um, that we want to talk about. And so Fred and my dad met uh, at Virginia Tech where my dad was um, a professor and Fred was working on his PhD. Uh, and my dad left to come to North Carolina State and he followed uh, one of the first um, department heads of the combined department, uh, Dr. Bob Truitt, uh, and, uh, and came down here to start the aerospace program. And so while my dad was in Raleigh and Fred was in Blacksburg, he continued to advise him on his PhD. And you know, back in those days, there was no such thing as texting or email or Zoom. When you wanted to have a relationship with somebody, you either did it through regular mail, you did it through face-to-face -face visits, or you did it through very expensive long-distance phone calls. So I'm sure that was uh, uh, very hard for them to do that, but they did. And so Fred received his PhD from 1965 in Virginia Tech and stayed on uh, the faculty for another five years, even serving as a stint as department head. Um, in 1970, uh, my father and Professor Truitt convinced Dr. Dijonet or Fred to come down to NC State to help them in, in leading the aerospace program. Um, you know, among the many roles that, that Dr. Dijonet held, he was department head, and he also um, uh, led a couple of the major centers here at the, at the university, uh, including uh, the, being the director of the NASA-funded hypersonics program, as well as the, the Mars Mission Research Center, which at the time was the largest single uh, granted program in the University of North Carolina system and actually funded many of us uh, through graduate school uh, in the areas of hypersonics and space technology and textiles and composite materials. Um, and so while Fred was a great researcher in his own right, I think my dad always convinced Fred that he would excel at the administrative areas as well. And uh, probably because my dad didn't want to do those roles uh, himself, um, but Fred was always uh, the face of the program. Um, today, um, several of Fred's former students are in the audience. Um, we, we all reminisced last night at the MAE Hall of Fame dinner about, um, about some of the influences that the professors had, and, and Fred was, was definitely uh, um, uh, prominent in those words. Uh, he was my master's advisor as well as co-advisor on my PhD. Um, Fred worked with many of the top researchers at NASA, including NASA Langley Research Center, to develop computational tools for high-speed aerodynamics and aerodynamic heating, um, both in the supersonic and, and hypersonic regimes. Um, and these were tools that, that were really um, what we would now call lower fidelity tools, but before computational fluid dynamics really took off, these were the state of the art techniques. And they were used to design vehicles such as the space shuttle, as well as other hypersonic uh, reentry vehicles that NASA looked at. Um, Fred meant a lot to my career, uh, as well as others. He was a patient teacher, a mentor, a friend to many. Uh, he invested so much in our learning as students in connecting us to other people. I think many of us can owe a lot of the connections we had to either uh, getting jobs or making connections within the industry to him. Um, he always made time for us, and whenever I came on campus, even afterwards, he was always gonna make time to meet with me. Um, and although he retired more than 10 years ago, uh, I think we will always garner great memories and respect of him and the department. And I encourage you today, uh, it looks like the, the students, are, the former students are sitting over in this direction, but if you want to hear more about them, I encourage you to, um, to chat uh, and they can recount many of their stories. And, and as we'll, we'll come back here in a minute, um, 
Fred taught most of us our first compressible flow class where we learned about supersonics and, and shock waves and aerodynamic heating. So it's, it's sort of fitting that today's lecture is on, on supersonics. Uh, Rich, did you want to come up and make a few comments? <laughs> To the mic, to the mic. I just put one of my former colleagues on the spot, so. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm Rich Walls uh, from NASA. Um, I didn't prepare anything, so I like to say as an AE, I'm gonna wing it, <laughs> you know. Um, both uh, Fred, it's hard to call him Fred, but Fred and, and Dr. Hassan, I mean, they both had um, incredible impacts on my career. Fred, in particular, was um, my undergraduate advisor, and my master's advisor, and my PhD advisor, and Dr. Hassan, Hassan <laughs> was on my master's and PhD committee. And they were very different people, but they were very complementary people um, to each other. Um, I, my father was a civil engineering professor, and he knew them. Um, you know, my, he came in 1960, so he, he was here a little bit ahead of Basil's father, and um, so there was that connection, um, and I, I defected from civil engineering over here, but um, they, they both were very good. They were both, um, you know, Dr. Hassan, I remember, you know, he, he was very demanding, had a very high bar, you know, um, but cared about you deeply, and, and Fred was, you know, the more patient, the, the gentler one often. Um, they, they both helped you with your uh, the networking. I met so many people through them, and my connections to my career at NASA started through them uh, in my master's program. Um, so I wouldn't be, be where I am without them or the entire department here, but um, both incredible people, and I'm, I'm glad they um, are both being recognized today and onward. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know what else to say. They were great. Okay, thank you, Rich. Um, so let's see. Um, thank you all for um, letting us take that time to, to talk about Dr. Dijonet and his importance to the department. Um, so next I want to get into to welcoming our speaker for today. Uh, we have the great pleasure of welcoming, welcoming Mr. Ben Murphy from Boom Supersonic, where he serves as the Vice President of Sustainability. Uh, as many of you know, Boom will soon realize the world's next commercial supersonic transport, and I'm looking forward to the day, one day when I might be able to fly in it. So you notice I said will, it will happen. Um, and while the world has, has uh, uh, experienced commercial supersonic flight, but you know, when we had the Concorde, which I never got to fly, uh, I think it's safe to say that it was never really financially viable nor uh, extremely sustainable as we've experienced with other modes of transportation. So I won't steal Ben's thunder around that area because I know he's going to impart a lot of great knowledge and history on us, and so we're, we're excited to hear what he has to say. So for those of you who are students in the audience, and I'm really glad to see we have so many, um, Ben's a great example of um, how our, uh, you know, a career in aerospace can have great impact. Uh, he received his BS in aerospace engineering from Notre Dame and his master's of science uh, from the University of Cincinnati. Both great schools, but this one's a pretty good one, too. Um, and Ben has a background in propulsion and vehicle system design, uh, having supported many uh, military aircraft, including two of my favorites, the F-15 and the F-16, uh, while he was at General Electric. In addition to his current role uh, at Boom, he's extremely active in supporting both national and worldwide efforts in aviation sustainability. Uh, through his efforts with the Aerospace Industries Association, the, the FAA, and the International Civil Aviation Organization. Um, you know, it's not always that the technical work is the, uh, the thing that, that keeps things from happening, but oftentimes it's the regulatory environment and all the other things that we have to, to work through to make aerospace vehicles viable. So finally, there's another reason why we want Boom to be successful. And that's because, um, not because it's just cool to fly that fast, but because 
when successful, again, when, uh, it will bring several jobs to the state of North Carolina. Uh, those of you looking for jobs soon will certainly uh, appreciate that the aerospace industry in the state continues to grow. So with that introduction, um, let us give Ben a warm Wolfpack welcome, and please know that uh, both my dad and Fred are up there watching. They might fall asleep in the middle of it as they used to do uh, in other lectures, but they'll always, they would always wake up and ask good questions. So uh, I'm sure this group will definitely have great questions. And so we're really looking forward uh, to what you all at Boom are doing, and we really hope it'll be successful. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I certainly appreciate that, uh, that introduction and the warm welcome that I've received. I um, just want to start off saying I'm incredibly honored to be here today uh, and have the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what we're doing to revol uh, revolutionize commercial aviation. I feel like uh, space and the military side of things often get um, a lot more of the attention, but there's really an exciting revolution happening, a renaissance uh, in commercial aviation right now. Um, and so I'm excited to share a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to look at this through the lens of innovation, how you innovate in aerospace and how the various organizations, uh, be it startups or established companies, uh, innovate differently. Um, and so I think it's helpful to look at the past, uh, starting at the, the very front of aviation, um, when we think about how we can learn lessons from, from the past to drive future innovations. Um, I actually hadn't seen this news article until I, until I started uh, preparing for today's talk. Um, turns out that October 9th, 1903, the New York Times published an article that said uh, flying machines which will really fly might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanists in from 1 million to 10 million years. And then they followed up by saying, uh, no doubt the problem has attractions for those it interests, but to the ordinary man it would seem as if effort might be employed more profitably. Six weeks later, uh, the Wright brothers <laughs> proved that very wrong uh, by having the first uh, powered flight, uh, not only saying it's, it's much closer than a million years off, uh, but also starting a really rapid period of innovation. Uh, it only took a it did, it did, indeed, the, the birthplace of aviation. Um, so within 11 years, they had already found how to, how to make that useful. They'd gone from a, a, you know, a powered glider to the first passenger service. Uh, this was a one-seat airplane that flew between St. Petersburg uh, and Tampa, uh, the city of Tampa, across Tampa Bay. Um, and, and right off the bat, from the start of aviation, they saw the utility of speed. Uh, this was the kind of the first need for speed. This flight took 23 minutes. It was five dollars back in uh, in 1914, uh, and it, it that 23 minute flight beat taking a two hour boat or a, a four hour uh, train around Tampa Bay between the two cities. So right off the bat, you're already seeing uh, that the end of that New York Times quote be being proven wrong, where there is usefulness in in aviation. Within another 20 years, you saw regularly scheduled commercial flight. The DC-3 was the first, uh, um, you know, usually recognized as the first viable commercial airline uh, or, or, or uh, airframe. And, uh, you know, you had reciprocating motors. You changed from a, a fabric skin to a metallic skin. Uh, this one had 14 beds. Um, it still had to take multiple stops, so it still took on the order of 19 hours to get from New York to LA. But that's better than the alternatives. Um, the rapid innovation then continued with the, the Whittle engine. Um, anybody that's taken thermodynamics knows the Brayton cycle very well. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. And so uh, the jet engine really continued to propel aviation forward, um, switching to uh, you know, constant pressure combustion uh, with the rotating uh, compressor and turbines. That enabled the jet age, the, uh, the Havilland Comet, um, the first uh, jet airliner. Uh, and then with this came ca uh, pressurized cabin, um, obviously jet engine propulsion, uh, allowed it to fly higher, faster, further, and uh, really unlocked the world in a way that prop planes never could because it's, it was able to fly uh, considerably faster, 30 to 40% faster, without having to stop. And that leads us then to the Concorde, uh, arguably the pinnacle of, of uh, commercial aviation. And just a little bit of a history on the Concorde. The Concorde was, was actually 
Europe's equivalent uh, to the Cold War space race that the US had with Russia. Uh, it was uh, their sort of uh, pride, uh, you know, country pride or, or continent pride in the case of, of the Concorde, um, racing Russia and the Tupolev 144 uh, to have the first supersonic uh, airliner. And in doing so, they drove innovations that wouldn't have otherwise come. Uh, you know, when you look at how the variable um, inlets were able to set up the perfect oblique shock patterns, the engines uh, were more efficient than, than the previous engines, albeit still afterburning turbojet engines. Uh, the droop nose allowed the passengers, or the, the pilots, to see the runway on landing uh, because your angle of attack is so high. Um, and it really was a product ahead of its time. But because it was born out of uh, the Cold War era, um, it was a, a product without a business case. Nobody actually stepped back and said, do we need this? How many passengers are going to fly? Is it the right range? Is it the right speed? Uh, you know. And so ultimately, it was, it was not commercially successful. Um, now, a lot has changed since then, and, and I'll get into that. But it, it is really the kind of pinnacle of, of commercial aviation in my mind. Because after the Concorde, we went back to subsonic commercial aviation. And it's kind of interesting that both of the Cold War races are two of the few areas that we've seen regression in technologies. Uh, we can no longer send a man to the moon, a man or woman to the moon. Uh, and we, we can no longer step on a, a passenger aircraft. And so I'm really excited. I mean, we're in a renaissance of aviation where we're going back and we're regaining these capabilities um, in a way that is much safer and much more economically viable. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been great innovations in commercial aviation, things like turbofan engines, uh, greatly improved efficiency, reduced costs. Winglets, uh, fascinating uh, innovation that, that uh, significantly improved performance. Um, and then carbon fiber fuselages um, allowed you to cut a lot of weight out of airplanes. And so this isn't surprising. When you look at any technology, it follows kind of the conventional S-curve, where you start uh, with a new product. So this is the Wright Brothers' first flight here in North Carolina. Um, not a very high-performance aircraft by any uh, means of measurement. So uh, you can kind of choose what you want to measure, be it range, cost, speed, sustainability, and kind of aggregate those together. You then see very rapid innovation start. Radial engines, closed cabins, metallic airframes, all of that makes aviation safer, faster. Um, the jet engine then, I would kind of put at the, the middle of the S-curve, really un unlocking long, uh, fast flights. And then you see uh, the innovation start to kind of taper off as we get closer to today. Um, again, those turbofans, winglets, and composite aircraft. And right now, we're kind of at the top of this technology S-curve, in my opinion. Uh, again, a lot of great innovation is still happening, uh, but there are kind of smaller incremental changes. Airframers and, and engine manufacturers are fighting for a percent fuel burn or a few counts of drag reduction. Um, the big levers have kind of already been pulled. So what's next? And this is kind of the classical innovator's dilemma. If anybody hasn't read it, it's a great book. Um, I know I'm an engineer getting into some business theory, so dangerous, dangerous territory. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting case study when you think about innovation. So established companies right now are at the top of that S-curve for jet aviation. Um, there's still a lot of great innovations being done. But in order to get to a new product, supersonic aviation, you need to take a holistic step back. All of the tools that you've developed that are optimized for subsonic performance, for uh, noise reduction, a lot of those don't apply. And commercial aviation faces particular challenges um, compared to military aviation, right? We've had military supersonic jets for, for decades, but they don't necessarily meet the, the regulations, safety, noise, emissions that uh, a commercial airline has to face. And so you don't see the, the established companies making these step changes in innovations. They're uh, beholden to their shareholders, and uh, a huge capital outlay uh, that ends up proving incorrect would, would be catastrophic to an to a, um, established company. Additionally, um, Disruptive innovations, where you do go to a whole new product, tend to cannibalize existing um, products. And so, again, not to say that there isn't still great innovations happening. There still are breakthrough innovations happening in subsonic aviation. They tend to be at the system and component level. You're not seeing a holistic change in uh, vehicle design. Um, some things are being proposed right now when you look at the, the transonic truss wing, blended wing body, but we haven't seen any of those come to fruition yet. The other thing that I think uh, has somewhat stifled innovation is consolidation. Um, it's 
crazy to look at the last 100 years of aviation. These are four consolidation tracks just since 1980. Um, and you've just seen a repeated trend of consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. The last successful commercial aviation startup was the Douglas Aircraft Company in 1921. They then blended with McDonald's, and then they were bought out by Boeing. And so you've seen that consolidation and a lack of competition tends to dissuade innovation. Um, and so you know, this, combined with the, the hurdles of the innovator's dilemma, I think have kind of left us in the status quo of a flying, flying tube with, with, with conventional high aspect ratio wings. Um, but the exciting thing is that's all changing. So uh, unsurprisingly, I think startups are really uh, providing a forcing function to get us past this. Um, this is kind of some of a new phenomenon in the last 20 years. Uh, SpaceX, I think, was one of the first companies that proved that a startup can break into a very high barrier to entry field. Um, and you're seeing it now across the board. Um, I love this picture from AIAA, uh, Aerospace America. Uh, I think it does a good job showing the future of flight, the future of sustainable flight, where aviation almost blends into the background, but it's still a part of everyday life. And so there's a lot of exciting innovations happening right now. eVTOLs are getting a lot of attention. This is a whole new transportation mode for shorter range. Um, and then up in the upper left-hand corner, you see the Quest program, the X-59. So that's NASA's low boom supersonic demonstrator. Um, so looking to future generations of supersonic aircraft that can fly supersonic over land. Um, so it's a really exciting time for aviation right now. Um, when you look at electric air mobility, um, you know, batteries have challenges. They're great from a sustainability standpoint, but they're 25 pounds heavier than jet fuel. It takes 25 pounds of battery to equal one pound of jet fuel, roughly, today. Um, we've seen energy density improve, but it still has a long ways to go. So I think that that's going to be a new sector um, that connects you so you can get from campus to the, to the Raleigh Airport or uh, uh, from your home in a rural area to, to a city center. Um, hydrogen regional jets, then, I think are a second piece of the sustainable future. Hydrogen has the opposite challenge of batteries. It's actually lighter per unit of energy, but it takes up four times as much space. Hydrogen also has significant infrastructure challenges. Um, uh, because we don't have the ability to produce and transport hydrogen globally, um, and it can't store it at, at airports. Which leads us to uh, the emergence of net zero fuels, and I'll talk more on this later, sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF. Um, it's chemically almost identical to fossil derived jet fuel, uh, but has a much lower carbon footprint, and it's a drop in fuel, so that it's no changes are needed to infrastructure. And so when we pair that with supersonic flight, we, we think that that is the future of long haul commercial aviation uh, as these fuels develop. It's sustainable long haul, twice as fast, um, and, and really an exciting future. So I do wanna just take a step and back and talk about startups versus corporations. I think it's really interesting to think about the two. Startups focus on their resources. They leverage their people more than anything, whereas corporations focuses on processes. So corporations are great at executing. You can churn out a plane every 10 years pretty reliably and have some good innovations. But you're going to be following the book. You're going to pull out the design practice, and you're going to say, OK, this is how you design an airplane. And maybe the global research lab can toss in some new technology. Maybe universities can contribute to new technology. But they're going to be low-risk technologies. Vary by the book. Startups, on the other hand, you have no, no playbook. You have your previous experience, and that's it. And uh, you have to do a lot of different things. You have to be a generalist at a startup. Um, and that's a, a lot of fun. Uh, it also means that you learn by doing. You make a lot of mistakes, and it's, it's fun to learn that way. So for anybody that's considering their future career, I'd really encourage you to try and do both, um, whether you're a student or you know, already an established profes uh, uh, professional. If you've only worked for giant corporations, try a startup. It's a very different life, but it's a very fun way of learning. And I'll give you just a quick example from, from my career. So uh, I did a year stint out in Victorville, California, supporting GE flight test. Uh, they use a 747 to, to test their uh, new engines. They pull one of the four engines off, plug a new one on. This is the Leap 1B engine. Uh, I was the flight test uh, engine integration uh, leader for this program, uh, which means that I basically directed all the work to get the engine installed onto the aircraft and made sure that it safely operated. Again, we had a design guide. This is how we've done it the last 12 times we've done it. This is the steps you have to take. These are the pitfalls to watch out for. Um, and uh, you know that led to a very successful program. We had about 50, uh, 50 engineers and mechanics uh, in the hangar, 
and then the full force of GE Aviation if we had a phone a friend. So, uh, you know, it, it made for a very um, interesting way to learn and had a lot of great mentorship. But one of my mentors said, you know, it's the scars that define you. You learn from your mistakes. And I kind of looked around and I was like, I, I can't make any mistakes. There's so many checks and balances and, and so much process here that, uh, you know, it's really just doing it by the book. Compare that to the, the engine test uh, campaign that I led at, at Boom uh, about four years ago. Um, so this is our J85 engine. Uh, it's a 1960s uh, engine. It's originally used on a decoy missile. Um, and uh, you know, anytime you have a new, or <laughs> new application for an old engine, you have to make sure that it, it operates safely. Um, and so we wanted to learn how the engine operated and then stress it out to make sure that it didn't stall. So just like an airplane wing can stall, an engine can stall too, and pressure distortion is one of the things that can lead to that stall. Um, and so we wanted to do a, a test campaign. So this was uh, four of us that read, led this test in its entirety, um, and uh, a whole lot of lessons learned, a whole lot of mistakes were made. Uh, but it also gave us an opportunity to learn by doing and innovate. So when we think about um, doing engine operability testing, you want to recreate the distortion patterns created by the inlet. Big companies can do this by manufacturing an inlet and putting it in front of it, or using kind of vortex generators. What we did is we computationally analyzed the inlet and said this is the distortion pattern that we expect to create. And then we said how can we create that distortion pattern the most economical and quickest way? And we said, you know what causes pressure loss? Orifices. Cool, so let's take a series of different um, fineness meshes and overlay them to create the same pressure loss uh, field and uh, did a series of these, took some iteration to figure out what uh, porosity was needed to, to get the, um, the pressure losses that we wanted. But we iterated on that and we were able to safely stress the engine out in the conditions that we expected it to see in the airplane. The other way that we innovated was to increase back pressure on the nozzle to try and get the engine to stall. You could have redesigned the nozzle, you could have come up with an elaborate new control scheme or we 3D printed titanium wedges that went onto the nozzle flaps to reduce the nozzle area, you know, thinking about compressible aerodynamics, uh, and increase the back pressure behind the turbine, therefore putting more stress ultimately on the compressor. So just a, it, some examples of how you can innovate in ways that aren't necessarily earth shattering, but when you get creative, there's a lot of fun ways that you can innovate that uh, uh, really only happens at startups. All right, so with all that in mind, let's get into supersonics and our product. So we started with that little uh, uh, puddle hopper quite literally. Uh, that was the first time that we saw a huge advancement in speed, right? When we look over the last 200 years of transportation, um, we've seen progressive improvements in speed. Started with horse and carriage, you didn't go very far, rarely outside of your county. Um, steamships and, and trains then allowed you to get longer distances, but a lot of times they were one-way trips. Prop planes then were another disruptive technology that lets you get across the ocean in maybe a day or two. Um, subsonic jets, like I said, I think that that was really the pinnacle of, of commercial aviation that now lets you get across the pond in a day. Uh, and that's kind of where we stalled. There were only 14 Concorde ever built. Um, and so we're working to change that. And so Overture will get you New York to uh, LA, or sorry, New York to London uh, in about three and a half hours, um, which we think is a meaningful improvement. And there's a lot of benefits that come with a more connected world. Uh, huge portions of the global population rely on tourism for their economies, uh, tr travel and tourism. Um, being in person is incredibly more, you know, it has a lot of benefits. It's great to meet all of you today and it's get those interactions that you don't get over Zoom. Um, I think it also leads to a more peaceful world. When you understand other cultures, uh, it's hard to kind of have, you know, have animosity and, and go to war, current conflict aside. So I think that there's a lot of uh, second order benefits to a more connected world. And whether that's being done through uh, EV tolls that let you get you know, a couple hundred miles more easily, or supersonic flight making a meaningful difference in, uh, in transoceanic flight. And so that brings us uh, to just a quick video outlining some of the work we're doing.
time is high-speed travel for you? So that's the, uh, the development of our XB1 supersonic demonstrator uh, in about a minute. Um, obviously, a lot more to it. Uh, but before we get to that demonstrator, I want to talk a little bit about our, our main product. So this is Overture. And we consider this a truly disruptive innovation. It's an environmentally and economically sustainable supersonic transportation uh, airplane. Uh, like our CEO Blake said in that video, we want this to be accessible to everybody. This isn't a business jet. Uh, this is a 65 to 80 passenger airplane. We will start to cater to business class passengers, uh, but at fares that are considerably lower than the Concorde. The Concorde was infamously about $20,000 for a round trip across the Atlantic in today's dollars. Uh, we're confident that we can do it for 75% of that. Uh, and that's what business class passengers are paying now. And keep in mind that we're, we're still at the bottom of that technology S-curve. Now there are fundamental physics at play that make supersonic flight more challenging, wave drag being a big one. Um, but we still think that with enough focus and innovation, as we create future products, we can eventually get down closer to economy class fares. Uh, and so we really want this to be for everyone. Um, so one of the big challenges for commercial aviation, I mentioned this earlier, is having to meet regulations. And so one of the big ones is landing and takeoff noise, something called chapter 14 noise levels. That's defined by the International Civil Aviation Organization. Um, that is where we have had to innovate almost more than anywhere else was to meet chapter 14 noise levels. And this is something that we heard from customers, from airports, that we had to meet that. Um, and, and the regulators uh, agreed. Um, and so that is why you can't just take military technology and, and slap it into a, a commercial transport. You have to completely redesign the vehicle to perform well both subsonically and supersonically so that you can have quieter landings and takeoffs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our sustainability strategy, um, but really it's, it's the use of sustainable aviation fuel that allows us to do this. Recycling carbon to create uh, hydrocarbon fuel that has the similar properties to, to jet fuel, that energy density both volumetrically and mass-based. Um, when we do think about innovations, uh, wherever possible, we try to leverage all of that great innovation that's been done in the last 50 years since the Concorde. So we're using composite fuselage materials that were pioneered by the 787, fly-by-wire technologies that were pioneered by Airbus, but we're putting them in a new package and then throwing some of our own uh, really critical innovations on top. Uh, and then one of the other big design constraints is we wanted to work in existing airports. We don't want every airport that Overture flies out of to have to go get a whole bunch of new ground support equipment. Another one of those kind of considerations when you think about setting requirements at the start of your design process, uh, that isn't always considered. Um, and we think that that's critical to our success, and United and American and Japan Airlines agree. So that was feedback we got from them, that we had to listen to the customer and make it so that they didn't need new uh, ground support equipment. Um, I did you know, show XB1, so this is our one-third scale technology demonstrator. You'll see it looks quite a bit different from Overture. We implemented a lot of lessons learned from XB1 onto Overture. Some of the learn learnings from uh, center-mounted engine uh, and the challenges that are associated with that helped contributed to driving to four engines. Um, you'll see rectangular inlets here. We actually leveraged the Concorde inlet, tweaked it a little bit, made it better using kind of some of our innovations. Um, and, and we'll still be able to leverage those learnings onto Overture because it's the same 2D profile um, that's creating that oblique shock structure, just rotating it instead of extruding it. Um, so uh, we're currently uh, testing this out in, in Centennial, south of Denver, um, and we are planning on shipping it to Mojave before the end of the year, uh, where we'll do flight testing over the Edwards Supersonic Corridor. Um, and the, the really important thing about this is that this is getting us another iteration up the S-curve before we get to our first product. And so it's, it's another iteration loop that helps to accelerate that technology development to that period of rapid growth that I think is going to happen in the next 30 or 40 years. So I'm going to dive into three of the key innovations that we're leveraging. Um, again, we're, we're taking all of the lessons learned by the broader industry, everything I talked about at the start. Uh, but we're really doing a few key things. First and foremost is leveraging high fidelity computational fluid dynamics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're doing that. But uh, we can't just take the previous design and make a few tweaks. We have to uh, kind of start from scratch. Military designs are all classified. So um, we've had to build tools that allow us to run high fidelity optimizations. 
Second up is noise analysis and reduction. And this is an incredibly strong driver. And computational aeroacoustics is a very niche field. You talk about generalists. That's, that's not a generalist field, uh, but it's a really interesting field. Uh, and it's incredibly important because communities around airports, um, uh, you know, noise is a huge consideration. So this is one of our computational aerodynamic uh, aeroacoustic runs of our landing gear um, using uh, lattice Boltzmann codes. And then last is sustainable aviation fuel. So these are synthetic fuels that can recycle carbon, pulling CO2 out of the air to produce those fuels. Uh, this is a picture of, of the production plant of our partner air company, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, um, actively producing these net zero carbon fuels. So when we think about high fidelity CFD optimization, right, you, you start with your, your first order plate theory, simple equations. Every textbook has them. That's where you start. You can't design an aircraft with confidence uh, in that way. You have to go up in fidelity. And uh, you know, so going up through uh, your, your simple order CFD all the way up to RAND CFD. Not only are we running RAND CFD, but we're running it in an optimization loop. There's a ton of constraints. This loop is, is our logic from 2017. We now have over 100 different gates in our design optimization loop to the point that it has to be ran on high powered computing. Uh, not even counting the CFD that's done in the loop. And so for a lot of our company's history, we've really focused on developing these tools that allow us to, with high confidence, analyze the airplane. And it's not just aerodynamics. We have to get the weight right. We have to make sure there's enough space. We have to make sure that the, the wing structure is manufacturable, that there's room for spars, that there's room for fuel. You have to look at CG envelopes and make sure that as your center of pressure shifts when you go from subsonic to supersonic flight, you have the capability to move your center of gravity as well in your fuel systems. And you can't be doing that manually every iteration. So you have to automate all of those tools to get both high fidelity and high confidence in your answers, but also be able to churn through hundreds of design iterations very quickly. And so that is really one of the biggest innovations we have is this tool suite that we call Make Boom. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the most glamorous, but it's just a bunch of loops in software but it's incredibly critical. And then we have to pair that with you know, emerging CFD capabilities. So this is a, a little render of, of um, adjoint uh, CFD. So this is an optimization project uh, process that rather than using a parameterized equation where you have to change each, you know, think about your CAD software package, you have to discretize what you want to be able to change and then run that through gradient-based optimizers. That's very onerous and you don't ultimately get as much optimization as possible. So what adjoint CFD does is it actually perturbates the geometry. Each of these is what you're seeing is a different perturbation. And it creates a uh, matrix of partial derivatives. And this is not constrained by parameterization. So once you do this, you can actually have it analyze through all of these different perturbations, get your, gradient, or your, uh, your partial derivative matrix, and then come up with the most optimum solution for a given set of design constraints. And one example of where that's really been critical is propulsion airframe integration. So we talk about our gull wings having curvature that changes um, along the span of the wings. And a lot of that came from this kind of CFD where uh, we want to minimize uh, the drag and maximize the lift that's recovered from the shocks coming off of the inlets in the cells. And you wouldn't be able to do that, at least not to the level that we have, if you were using parameterized um, optimization methods. Um, so this is really a huge field that's incredibly critical, and it's more so critical for supersonics because your sensitivities are so steep. If you're off by a little bit early in design, you know, a subsonic airplane could be like, oh, I'll just throw a little bit more fuel in it. Well, if we're off by that much, we don't have the volume for more fuel, and we probably can't take the higher takeoff speeds if we needed to add more weight. So you have to have the design very high fidelity very early in the design cycle for a supersonic vehicle. The second uh, suite of, of technologies that we've pursued is, is noise reduction. And we're talking landing and takeoff noise. This is community noise around airports right now. Um, so a couple of different ways that you can do it. First off, you can't measure it. You can't figure out how to reduce it. So in this case, using large eddy simulation, um, Charles is a, is a software suite for uh, you know, time accurate uh, CFD that actually captures both the frequency content and the intensity of jet noise. Jet noise is created by the shear layer interaction coming out of your, your engine um, relative to ambient. And uh, you know, that creates typically a, a lower frequency noise. 
you can trade that frequency, lower frequency noise through mixer design, chevron design, thinking about how you design your nozzles. So we designed about 12 different nozzles that we tested in a three stream uh, hot jet uh, anechoic chamber at a, at a Nera, France, um, to really make sure that we're capturing as much noise reduction as possible from our technologies. Uh, and so what those do is when you think about a lobed mixer, you're increasing the uh, area that you're getting that shear layer mixing. And so instead of just having a simple splitter where you have one annular or circular um, shear layer, you now have a much more complicated shear layer with a lot more surface area. So same amount of energy in that shear layer, but across more uh, you know, surface area. And so you trade that low frequency noise for high frequency noise, and then you can optimize those trade-offs to, to reduce the overall jet noise. So again, computational air acoustics, noise reduction, not for everyone. It's a really niche field, but I think it's a really fascinating field, and it uh, has a lot of room for advancement. The other mechanism that we're using to reduce noise is a variable noise reduction system. And this is something we think will benefit all of commercial aviation. So when you're on your takeoff roll, you usually have your peak C, um, uh, CL. You wanna, you wanna be able to safely take off the runway at as low of speed as possible. And typically, airplanes continue to climb at that peak CL for a while. That means that the engines have to stay spooled up until the pilot changes the flap configuration and can pull the throttles back. You then change into more of a peak L over D configuration where you're able to reduce your engine thrust. We're developing an automated system that does all of those configuration changes safely, safety first for any commercial application, uh, but then maintains you know, continued airworthiness while changing the configuration shortly after takeoff so that we can pull our engines back almost immediately and reduce community noise. Um, so this is one of the most exciting innovations in my mind uh, that we've really pioneered is, is this variable noise reduction system that enables us to have smaller jet engines that have reduced wave drag but still meet landing and takeoff noise requirements. Obviously, a company name like Boom, the Sonic Boom is also a consideration. So we're, uh, we're not designing Overture to be a low boom aircraft right now. Um, over land supersonic flight is prohibited almost universally around the world. And so we don't want our business case to have to depend on a policy shift, a global policy shift to allow supersonic flight over land. And so we've identified about 600 city pairs that we think are viable predominantly over water. Uh, we can still fly supersonically over land at about Mach no, uh, 0.94, which is still considerably faster than what you'd get in a 737, which is around 0.8. Um, but we'll only fly supersonically over water We've still done a whole lot of analysis on sonic boom modeling, both the primary boom, that mock cone right up at the front that you see on the right, but also understanding all of the reflections and refractions, the secondary and tertiary booms. Uh, when the Concorde first entered service, um, it was very loud on takeoff and landing. They knew that they could only fly supersonically over water, but you had communities that were complaining about this low rumble, and it took several years for them to figure out that those are actually the reflections and refractions of the primary sonic boom from the Concorde that are coalescing mostly into low frequency noise and causing this very you know, earth rumbling, low frequency noise to coastal communities. And so we want to avoid that. Again, sustainability includes more than the environment. It means being responsible to communities as well. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time on secondary boom modeling to make sure that the secondary boom doesn't reach land either. And then last up is sustainable aviation fuel. Um, you know, this is, I think, the other most exciting innovation that we're seeing in aviation. Every airplane today flies on jet fuel, fossil-derived jet fuel. Why haven't we spent more time looking at how we can get an improvement out of the fuel? And this is, you know, CO2 improvements are a big one. When you think about trying to, to uh, address the climate crisis, we have to have sustainable fuels. And uh, SAF is an option that immediately allows for replacement of fossil-derived fuels using recycled carbon. And it, it does this in a, in a much more uh, higher integrity way than kind of your, your, your grandmother's uh, uh, bio-based ethanol, uh, which is not necessarily as sustainable. Um, sustainable aviation fuel is using technologies like conversion of, of waste cooking oils, French fry fat, into gas. Um, municipal solid waste, so you, the trash that's in your, your uh, you know, landfills, if you were to just leave them in a the landfill, they're gonna decompose into methane, which is an even more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So rather than just letting those emissions happen, let's take that, gasify it, create syngas, which is CO and, and hydrogen, and then break those CO chains and create a hydrocarbon molecule. 
there's a whole suite, there's nine different technologies that are approved today to produce synthetic aviation fuel, all of them uh, achieving at least a 50% carbon reduction, which is hugely meaningful. But what we're most excited about is a technology called power to liquid. Uh, this is where you use renewable energy to pull carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, and then electro use electrolysis to pull hydrogen out of water, and now you're literally able to close the carbon loop in a very high integrity, very meaningful way, uh, such that every uh, molecule or every atom of carbon that you're burning was originally pulled out of the air. Um, and this isn't science fiction. This is, this is actively being produced today. It's in small quantities and, and still quite expensive. It's at the beginning of the S-curve. Uh, but we think that as renewable energy prices drop uh, and become more available, that this is a, a very impactful way to uh, decarbonize long-haul aviation without really needing to change infrastructure. You can use existing airplanes. Um, and so it's, it's really an exciting technology. Um, and it's an interesting intersection of chemistry and chemical engineering and, and aviation. I'm gonna nerd out just a little bit because this is really where I'm most passionate. Beyond the, the carbon dioxide uh, benefits, you can also get additional fuel property improvements. The military has known this for decades with their special fuels. JP7 was a specially blended set of molecules uh, that had a lower vapor pressure so it didn't evaporate at the high altitudes that the U2 uh, flew at. And JP7 was another unique fuel that had very high thermal stability. When fuel gets too hot, you have what's called coking where you basically have um, carbon deposits that happen in your fuel lines or fuel nozzles. And so if you increase the thermal stability, like you have to when you're flying fast, where your total your stagnation temperatures are 200, 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you need a higher thermal stability fuel. And so that's very expensive to take fossil drive fuel and tune the molecules. But if you're already synth um, synthesizing the molecules, you can tune and synthesize whatever molecules you want. Um, and so this chart on the right is from uh, University of Dayton. Uh, it shows uh, all of the shapes are the common molecules that are in fossil-derived jet fuel. The kind of big set of squir squ uh, squiggles in the middle, that's what the fuel properties of, of Jet A is. Um, the y-axis is uh, energy density on a uh, volumetric basis, and the x-axis is specific energy on a mass basis. And if you start to squint and look at what some of these molecules can do, um, you can actually see that you can get a 15% improvement if you were to only use this molecule in energy density or a 4% uh, improvement in specific energy. Now, when you start getting into that level of tuning, you also need to modify your group buster, but it's a huge field of untapped uh, work on co-designing fuels and, and engines that work together to get the properties that you want. Um, and so I think it's, it's, we're gonna see a whole lot of innovation uh, in the coming decades, now that we can uh, economically synthesize fuel molecules um, as we think about how we can tune the fuels. And so I mentioned that this is, this is happening today. This is our partner air company, just a quick video um, showcasing some of their work. Time to take off. To take off the limitations of how fuel is made. To take fossil fuels off the table and take on the responsibility of sustainable innovation. It's time for a new take on takeoff. Introducing a jet fuel made from the very air we travel through. We're using carbon technology to take CO2 from the atmosphere and transform it into sustainable aviation fuel. Turning our planet's most abundant pollutant into a never ending resource. The path to a cleaner future is in the air. Time to take off. So I think they do a really great job of making it exciting, right? When you talk about the nitty gritty of fuel like I just did, you know, your eyes glaze over. So, uh, but I think it's really an exciting opportunity here. One of the other things that Air Company is doing, um, you know, ethanol and hydrocarbon fuels are, are only uh, a small amount off, just, just a few atoms of oxygen. Um, so their process also allows them to make alcohols. Uh, so they're actively producing vodka and perfume today. Uh, which I think is a good way to get consumers a little bit more excited about sustainable aviation fuel. Um, so they're also producing SAF today as well on a, on a small scale, and they've tested their SAF at 100% uh, flight test with the United States Air Force. So we're really excited about that. 
Um, all right, so moving on, uh, you know, that was just kind of a quick smattering of, of where we're focusing our innovations. Happy to take any questions at the end. But I do want to talk just a little bit about the next generation of innovation. Um, and, and real quick pause, this is cheesy, but it's all you. Um, we really need more talented engineers. Um, this is a little bit of a clickbaity headline from Washington Post, why the economic future of the US depends on making engineering cool. Nobody told me engineering wasn't cool already, so I missed that memo, but I think it's true, right? Um, people are gonna choose fields that they think are exciting or uh, you know, uh, make a big impact. And I'm shocked to see that you know, engineering continues to kind of lag. But they're in incredible demand. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics, this chart on the right, um, shows levels of unemployment rates. And the top line is uh, not college grad or engineer. Uh, the middle line is college grad, but not engineer. The bottom line is engineer. So um, this goes to show that engineers are in incredibly high demand. And we're seeing that anecdotally. We are uh, having a tough time hiring enough engineers. The companies that we're working with, our tier one partners, are saying that they can't hire enough engineers. There's a serious shortage here. And we need to find and untap new sources of engineering talent. Um, so thank you to everyone in this room that is an engineer. Uh, go tell your friends, your family, like we, we need more engineering talent. And it's going to be a, a big challenge because we're seeing this really exciting bifurcation of technologies. And each of those fields need both specialists and generalists. And so whether you want to get a PhD and dive really deep in a subject or focus on system level engineering and connecting the pieces, um, there's going to be roles for you across the spectrum of, of engineering and particularly in aviation as we see space uh, exploration uh, exploding and we see all of these new modes of advanced mobility um, in the commercial space. And so with that, a little bit of a shameless plug for Boom. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we are um, building our final assembly line here in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we're really excited to be coming back to the birthplace of aviation for our renaissance of, of rekindling supersonic uh, uh, civil flight. Um, and so we'll be down in Greensboro at the airport uh, from there. Uh, we have 65 acres. We you know, currently move in some earth right now. We're hoping to, to formally launch the, the build and construction um, shortly in the next few months. Um, so we currently uh, don't have a large footprint here in North Carolina. We're currently based in Denver. We're hiring a bunch for our Denver location. There's some pamphlets around if you'd like to apply for those jobs. But for anybody that's, uh, you know, a little more of an underclassman, a um, year from now, we're going to be hiring extensively for this facility. Um, and one of the reasons that we chose North Carolina, we love the aviation legacy. We needed a place close to the coast because we can't flight test supersonically over land. And the Edwards Air Force Base corridor isn't big enough for overture. But we also recognize we need thousands of engineers, and we're not going to be able to hire them from, from existing um, talent because there's, such a, uh, there's so much demand. So we have to look at, at pipelines in the university systems, and North Carolina really excels um, with your university systems. So uh, we're going to be looking to all of you, really excited to hear that you're expanding your department. Um, we need that, and so we just need to make sure that we're getting all of that uh, diverse talent and, and unlocking um, really all of that knowledge and advancement. So uh, with that, I'm happy to, uh, to take any questions, uh, and thanks again for, uh, uh, for having me. <laughs> I'm sure everybody has a lot of questions, so if, uh, we're going to please raise your hand and we'll try to get a, a mic to them, or how do we do the questions? All right, so raise your hand and I'll come to you and uh, we'll get questions. And I'll proactively just address, I think, everyone's first question. If you've seen the news at all, um, you know, there's questions around our engine. Uh, we've, uh, you know, been very honored to work with Rolls-Royce the last uh, two, three years. They've really helped us advance our design, uh, but we, we mutually kind of decided that, that it wasn't the right fit. Uh, so we've been working with another engine partner in the last few months, and we're really excited to announce that new engine partner uh, sometime in December. Uh, so keep, keep your eyes out for the news. Uh, we think it's a really uh, exciting kind of concept that uh, uh, changes the paradigm on how engines are um, manufactured and overhauled. So um, just yep. wanted to get that question out of the way since I think it's, it's often the I, first question I received. I know that, that question, question was on top of it. Hold on, hold on. I'll give it to John first. 
John Gold, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ben. Thank you very much. I'm John Oles from SpaceWorks in Atlanta. Enjoyed your talk. Good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, one uh, point of clarification and then a question. Um, you were talking about the ticket price. Mm -hmm. And at one point I saw 75% less than Concord, and yeah. another point I thought I heard 75% of Concord, which is less. the right one. Less. 75% so quarter. We're, we're targeting $5,000 a ticket. Round trip. Now, that'll be set by airlines. We're designing it to be profitable at those prices. Airlines will follow supply and demand and charge what they choose to charge. But when we look at the operating economics as we were designing the airplane, we think that that still uh, is, a, is a profitable ticket price for Transit Atlanta. We agree. Um, second question, follow up, is still related to funding. Can you comment or say anything about fundraising challenges? the non-recurring costs that still remain ahead of you and where that's going to come from? Yeah, I can't talk a whole lot about it. Um, you know, engine pr or aircraft programs um, range from 6 to $8 billion, and that's what we're targeting. Um, we've had a lot of success to date uh, from a number of sources. So we have some, some Air Force grants. We have prepaid deposits from the airlines. Um, and then conventional um, um, venture capital and, and other capital sources. Um, so, you know, just like any startup, we're looking to transition out of fundraising and into leveraging those pay prepaid milestones, debt financing, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But uh, we're confident that uh, we have a, a clear roadmap to get to that top line number. Hey, Ben, Rich. Um, so you probably can't answer this one, but to follow up your engine announcement, are you going with a startup engine manufacturer? You're right, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You were. Spot yeah. on. I will say it's not, it's not us. We are not okay. designing our own engine. All right. We'll look forward to that. Um, the noise, you, you referred to um, meeting the chapter, four, there's a chapter 14 by procedure. Is that all that um, the changing NRS? the flaps? That's yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah. So um, fundamentally, yes. So that's why we add that caveat, because the current regulations would not allow that use of procedure, even though it results in a very meaningful noise reduction. Yeah. So that's where a lot of the work with the International Civil Aviation Organization and the FAA comes in um, to show that that process is both airworthy and meets a, uh, results in a meaningful noise reduction that aligns with the same, when you look at the three no noise points, sideline, flyover, and approach, um, it allows us to, to meet those Chapter 14 noise levels. Okay, so you, you will need a, a change of rule. Yep, and yeah. that's okay. in process in, right. in okay. ICAO um, with Thanks. the expectation of it being completed in 2025. Um, and so now there's a, some university research on it as well. MIT and Georgia Tech have both kind of been doing independent assessments uh, to confirm that it is airworthy and, and uh, um, results in a meaningful noise reduction. Yep. Um, while you text, right? While you are on texting uh, uh, for the aircraft, do you need a subsonic uh, like to re to reach some speed to start your um, uh, non-breathing engine, right? You need to reach some optimal speed and then start it. So, do you use any um, turbofan engine to start, like, to reach that speed? Uh, so, if I'm understanding your question, uh, so these are turbofan engines. There's no ram or scramjet. Okay. Um, so, we'll use the same single uh, engine cycle throughout the the operating regime. We do have, you know, a variable exhaust nozzle, which allows us to change the engine performance somewhat. Uh, throughout the operating regime, but uh, I guess I didn't say our Mach number, so we're a Mach 1.7 aircraft. Um, at that speed, you're still able to use pretty well proven um, jet engine technology. To go just a layer deep, the, the difference that you see between like a Mach 1.7 and a subsonic engine is the engine itself actually has a lower uh, OPER, has fewer compressor stages, because you're still lim limited by the same T3s and T4s, but you're getting that compression out of the inlet and you're able to recover a lot of the energy um, through compressible aerodynamics that, uh, uh, so you're actually getting some of your compression to improve your brake and cycle efficiency through the inlet, and so you have fewer compressor stages. But it is still a conventional uh, medium bypass uh, turbofan engine. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, you, you talk about systems engineering, and our curriculum mainly focus on kind of individual discipline, like CFD, mm -hmm. acoustic proportion materials. Do you have any suggestions about you know, how we train the student I mean, to kind of cover that system engineering aspect? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I hadn't heard the term systems engineering until several years into my career at GE because it's all discipline specific. Um, 
you know, I think one of the great ways is to get involved in some of the extracurriculars. I got a tour this morning and saw uh, all of your Baja and, and Design Build Fly Labs. Those force you to think at those different levels, and it's on a small scale that you can really see the full picture. Um, so I think that that's one way to really level up on systems engineering is to get engaged in some of those extracurriculars. Um, I think you know your typical senior design courses also try to bring those together, but I think it's a really good point that there's probably a way to better um, marry that with, with how you kind of learn um, because at the end of the day, nothing you do outside of academia is, is truly one field. Even if you are a subject matter expert that went very deep, you can make the best wing, but if you don't talk to the structures team, uh, uh, you've just created you know, inch spars that can't take the wing load uh, because you want it to be super thin supersonic airflow. So uh, I think it's a great point, and, and yeah, off the top of my head, I think getting involved in those extracurriculars is a great way to see the entire system at a manageable level to learn those, those skills. Yeah, thanks, yeah. I have kind of a non-technical question. So where do international students fit in the scheme for like your search or talent? Because I haven't looked across this room, but I'm pretty sure if you do, you'll see a lot of those faces. But whenever we try to apply for the jobs, the first thing that comes across is international students, sorry, US citizens only, or the company has to take some efforts to get us clearance. So what is your take on that, and what, how would you describe your efforts to get that clearance for us? Thanks. Uh, another great question, and another one that I, I don't have the answer to. Um, it is a definite challenge, right? When we talk about we need to leverage all of the talent, uh, it's export regulations that, that drive that. Um, so, so that's the US government. Um, I agree, it needs to be changed. And I think you know there's, there's opportunities when you look at university and private partnerships that you can stay engaged in developing some of these academically. Um, but obviously that's not getting it implemented. So I don't have a great answer to you other than I agree that it's a challenge. Um, it is one that we're already trying to tackle though. So we are um, slowly working to, to set up a program that allows us to hire certain roles um, from the international talent pool. Um, and it's challenging. You mentioned sustainable fuels and about how that's how what's going to power mm -hmm. it. And you also mentioned infrastructure that's already in place at airports. Is it your expectation that the fuels are going to become cost efficient and then also being used for other aircraft as well? So it is? Yeah. So uh, short answer, yes. So sustainable aviation fuel, there's one pathway uh, that's fully mature, if you will. It's hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids. It's using waste oil. That is already pretty price competitive uh, because it's had 15 years of R&D. The challenge is there's only so much French fry fat in the world. So that's not going to solve global aviation, which is why we have to look to these other pathways. Um, again, go back to that technology S-curve. It takes iterations. So we need to be able to support those fuels right now while they are still a little bit more expensive. So that's why we have a partnership with Air Company to, to have 5 million gallons starting in 2027 to power Overture. Um, we are also actively buying SAF through book and claim systems, um, the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance, which lets third parties pay that premium. Uh, we certainly think, as with everything, that there's a path to economic viability. Right now, the US actually offers uh, some pretty strong incentives that get it pretty close to parity, even today, uh, maybe within a dollar or two. It's obviously only in the US, and you want to ultimately get to the point that it's cost parity, not price parity. So it really just takes iterations. The fastest way to get there is to, to work hand in hand with the renewable energy um, sector. And so power to liquid, where you're using renewable energy to pull carbon out of the air and combine it with hydrogen, becomes economically viable at about two cents a kilowatt hour. And you're already seeing that in California and Saudi Arabia, which are great for solar, they're actually seeing one cent a kilowatt hour. So it's directly tied, that's why some people call it e-fuels, because it is taking electricity. So it's very synergistic with the renewable energy uh, revolution that we're seeing. Right now, it's competitive because there's limited renewable energy, but we want a future a decade from now where everything is using renewable energy. Yeah, absolutely. There's huge coalitions um, that we're a part of and, and uh, taking an active leadership role in. Uh, CAFI would probably be the one if you're curious about learning more. The, uh, commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. Um, they're, uh, they're doing a lot of work um, 
There's some other policy organizations that are focused on advancing policy changes that we're a part of. Um, yeah, would, would love to chat more if you're curious. Uh, but I'd probably start with Kathy. Um, they're doing a lot of really great stuff. Uh, Ryan Parker, undergraduate student here. Um, you mentioned shortly after takeoff a sort of autonomous system to change configuration. Um, what lessons were you guys able to learn from recent accidents with the MCAS system on board the 737 MAX? And that autonomous system obviously would help pilots uh, you know, transition easier, but do you expect significant training for uh, overture pilots? Yeah, great questions. Um, so let's see, so starting with the, the autonomous system, um, fundamentally different systems, right? Our system has limits built in that would not allow what happened with the 737 MAX. Um, when we look at the reversionary modes, uh, the goal is to never put the aircraft in a position such that an additional failure would result in unsafe flight. So one engine failure is the big one there. Um, actually hugely beneficial having four engines because if you do lose an engine, you only lose 25% of your thrust instead of 50% of your thrust. Um, so it is definitely top of mind to ensure that there is no mode that could result in a combination of failures that would result in an unsafe operating condition. Big one is allowing pilot override. Um, which then, yes, does require training. So we've, we've been uh, talking with a lot of the Concorde pilots and engineers to understand how they trained. Now the Concorde was very different. They had a flight engineer, um, and talking to the folks that were flight engineers on the Concorde, it's incredible to, to learn what all they had to manage real time, CG movements and, and safe operations, reversionary modes of the inlet. Um, so yeah, we do expect uh, some training. Um, but by and large, again, we're, we're using systems that have already been proven, like fly-by-wire systems um, that do take a lot of the load off the pilots. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a different aircraft. Higher, higher angle of attack for takeoff and landing is going to be a little bit unconventional. Um, and then some of the, you know, reversionary modes will, will take training. Thank you, Ben. Uh, earlier, you mentioned the use of CFD and helping you understand some of the nozzle flow, and you mentioned, you know, disruptive technologies. For the professors here and the students who will go on into graduate school, what disruption and technologies do you think will need to happen in or, you know, at the foundational level in order to, to help companies like you uh, do a better job in designing these things, not only better, but faster? Yeah, uh, great question. Speed and accuracy are the two big ones, right? Um, a, a tool is only as good as the calibration, and so computational aeroacoustics, those time accurate codes, um, are getting there, but they're like, the, their existence, the lattice Boltzmann method is already a huge disruption. It doesn't work for supersonic flows, so you have to go to large eddy simulation for supersonic flows and hot gases. So if you can expand the capabilities of these codes to new regimes, that allow for the efficiency improvement that they, they enable. Um, that would be a big one, so op, you know, operational efficiency. Luckily, we're in a really exciting time with cloud computing, which is what we use through Amazon Web Services, where we can leverage huge supercomputer capabilities to do those simulations, but it, you can always do them faster and cheaper. Um, where I think probably the bigger disruption is gonna be is uh, getting them accurate, getting them accurate the first time. So when we, you know, CAA is still um, an emerging field, I'd say, um, to be able to get accurately both the frequency content and the, the intensity, the magnitudes. Um, and that's why we had to do a pretty extensive test was to calibrate those CAA tools and either add scalars or tweak some of the turbulence models to, uh, to more accurately inform it. Now those tests are very expensive. So I think that the disruption will come once we can really see computational methods be used the first time, and arguably when you start to think about certification by computation. Um, now, safety first, so we're, I think, a long ways off from that. But I think that's probably where it'll come. And then obviously, you know, DNS, direct numerical simulation, getting that um, uh, economical would be a huge disruption. Hi, uh, thank you for this. Uh, Derek Cheston, NASA Glenn Research Center. Um, I'm in the systems engineering at, at, within NASA. Uh, one of the questions I, uh, I have as you look at it as a new startup, um, 
how do you take, do, oh, how much advantage of new technologies along, align with uh, product lifecycle management tools, the overall integrated environment? Is that something you found advantageous being new, a startup to, to kind of get things going together all at once, uh, i.e., is your, is your environment well integrated such that there's a, there's a lot of efficiencies in all of integration of electrical structures, mechanical, thermal? Yeah, you're uh, probably not the best person to answer that one. Um, I'm not directly aligned with our PLM solutions. Um, uh, happy to follow up afterwards. I know that we are looking at better ways to standardize because we are building a system from scratch, and it's definitely one of the opportunities that is presented. The challenge is all of our tier one suppliers all use different systems themselves. So, um, you know, the gold standard is certainly a fully integrated product suite. I can't chat, uh, you know, I can't talk to exactly what pain points and opportunities we see. Uh, practical question about hiring. Um, I looked on your open postings and they're, the vast majority of the roles are at the lead and principal level, which most university students are not at, um, or their internships for like 2023. Yeah. Do you guys have a new grad pipeline coming for both undergraduate and graduate students who are entering the workforce? Yes, so uh, I, I kind of hope, I wish that this, this talk had been last week because we had quite a few intern and new grad jobs open and they just get snatched up really, really quickly. Um, I would encourage you, we are continuing to grow very rapidly. Um, check about six to eight weeks before you graduate just because we don't, our roles don't stay open long and we typically want people to start immediately. Um, so unfortunately, we've filled our 2023 internships already, um, but we expect 2024's internship program when we do have our facility here to be much larger. And then for folks that are graduating, we certainly do hire new grads um, as the need arises. So um, again, I'd say two months before graduation was probably about the right time to start looking. So, but it, it's kind of ad hoc because we're a startup, so it's where the need is. Hi, uh, Dean Eklund, Air Force Research Lab. Uh, two questions. Um, uh, the first is I, I didn't catch the size of the aircraft, whether it's the Concord size that you've envisioned. And the second question is um, uh, with the, the reliance on uh, computational tools for the design, you, you've commented on the need for um, accuracy and validation. And I wondered if you could comment on um, the status of the experimental facilities in the country and whether or not uh, we need to um, uh, put more resources uh, in, in our experimental facilities. Uh, yeah, so first question, uh, it's, it's roughly Concord size. It's about 200 feet long. Um, one of the primary design constraints was to make it fit in narrow body gates or in most narrow body gates because we recognize that wide body gates take, uh, you know, extra infrastructure to build and they're in high demand. So that was actually one of the pretty strong design constraints was for it to fit in a narrow body gate and everything from landing gear height, which impacts tail strike angle. So uh, uh, that one constraint really drove a lot of the design. On facilities, um, yes, I think we have outstanding facilities in the US, the NASA facilities, the DOD facilities, um, but I think they are uh, probably there's more needed. We are seeing uh, year, two year, three year wait lists to get into the facilities, and there's not a lot of the facilities that work, especially large supersonic tunnels, large continuous flow supersonic tunnels, which is what you need when you're trying to do a full suite of drag coolers, where you're doing small increments of, of uh, air uh, attitude and inclinations, um, and you need six off force reading. So there's really a, a very small set of tunnels, and I think we, we definitely need more funding to keep them uh, operating. So, um, you know, an unfortunate example was for the nozzle testing. Would have loved to have done that at NASA Glenn, but I think uh, the tunnel was down for maintenance for about a year, and it was the year that we, we needed that data to proceed with our design, which is why we ended up going to an Air France, which was a great facility. But uh, I definitely think that there is need for um, keeping the existing facilities operating at, at, at their prime and uh, um, 
you know, consider making the capital investments for new new facilities because it is it, it's a crowded space with the hypersonics folks, supersonics, the return of space, you know, all the space travel. There's a whole lot of demand. So I think short answer is yes. I think we need more more facilities. Love the facilities that we have. Not not at all a knock on that. Just need more of them. So you showcased um, this really awesome design optimization framework um, to incorporate a lot of the facets uh, of the aircraft. Um, my question is. How do you consider some of the more um, holistic uh, manufacturing considerations and constraints within that framework? Yeah, so that's, um, <clears throat> yeah, some things you can't automate, right? Some things you always need human eyes to look at. So um, up until, when we, we, when we were in conceptual design, uh, we were doing roughly six week uh, design cycles. So basically what that was was a couple of weeks of the, the automated tool, a couple of weeks of humans looking at it, checking first order, very high level manufacturing considerations, implementing that feedback back in, adding new constraints to the optimizer, and then recycling that. And so we went through 51 different iterations over the last, uh, uh, we'll say, three or four years. Now that we've exited conceptual design and we're in preliminary design, uh, the use of the optimizer has kind of changed a little bit, where now our tool suite is really focused on increasing fidelity and we're making much smaller design changes, and we're spending a lot more time with the human element digging in manually. Uh, so not to say that the design suite is, is out of date. We're working on increasing to the next level of fidelity, calling it kind of zeroth order, first order, second order. Second order is where we were like last year, and now we're working to get it up to that third order so it becomes more of a um, design tool than an optimization tool. So, and it's still a cycle design, right? You still, it's just now we're talking four, five, six months between cycles. Uh, thanks for the lecture, that was very great. And the question that I have, maybe that's maybe later down the road, but what do you think about the maintenance? and the repair that how much you would need to have training for people everywhere that they can do the repair and the maintenance. Yeah, it's not too far down the road. It's something we are thinking about. Um, just like engineers, there's a shortage of A&P mechanics, so airframe and power plant mechanics. Um, another, you know, we're gonna hire a, a small army of A&P mechanics as well for our facility. So um, definitely a need. Um, and then the, the aerospace, Again, I'm kind of out of my depth here. The, the, the MRO, maintenance, repair, and overhaul um, status quo of the aerospace industry is, is quite interesting where so much money is made on the back end. And so that is something that we have to consider now and think about is that the right business model or is there a world in which you shift more of the costs up front to make it better from a sustaining investment? So um, definitely things that we are thinking about. Um, I can't speak too deeply. Any other questions? Oh, ben, it was a great talk. Um, I kind of have a question about that picture there. You've got a, your demonstrator has a 2D inlet, mm -hmm. so, or concord type. That's an axisymmetric yep. type inlet. So what, what's, your, what's your history basis for, for that choice? Is mm -hmm. it, you're gonna have a variable cow of, um, spike inlet type thing? Yeah, or? great questions. Um, so, uh, again, we started with kind of the lowest risk when we think about those iterations. So we started with the Concord inlet and said, hey, that's a pretty good inlet. I mean, they did that with manual iterations. We kind of took that design, put it through a software suite, um, and uh, did our own optimization and squeezed a little bit more performance out of it. In some of the manufacturing, you know, we realized well, a rectangular inlet makes it really easy for mechanization. You just have one, one moving part. Uh, squares are not good pressure vessels. Not a new lesson learned, but we weren't well calibrated on how heavy um, it would necessarily need to be. Um, and so a number of decisions drove us to an axisymmetric inlet. Um, when we th again, when we think about the aerodynamics of them, they're common, right? You still have a similar, your ramp is now your spike. And so you still have the same set of oblique shocks. 
you'll still have similar diffuser geometry, just a revolve instead of an extrude. Uh, but circles are obviously better pressure vessels. Um, and when you look at supersonic inlets, you actually have a lot of thrust come from the inlet. Um, as far as variable <laughs> geometry, that's an ap active train. Uh, Mach 1.7 is sort of an interesting point where you don't absolutely need it. And so um, we're still weighing you know, the pros and cons of the added mechanism weight versus the improved off-design recovery, um, rather than just designing it for a point design of Mach 1.7. So, still an open trade. Medic. A question about uh, how, bus how your business has changed over time as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, have, you, have you had to adjust to how to incentivize uh, hiring and retention of employees? Are you seeing diff any kind of trends, work from anywhere versus we need you here? Uh, those kinds of questions. Yeah, I haven't been involved a lot with our hiring or, or remote work. Um, I will say what, what we saw during the pandemic, because we, you know, pre-revenue, we, we actually weathered the pandemic quite well and, and picked up a lot of great talent during it um, as well there was kind of a slowdown. Um, so right now we are seeing the aerospace industry, I think, is recovering much more quickly than anybody predicted. And so I, I will just kind of reiterate that I think right now um, there's a, a lot of competition for talent. And I think when you look at the packages that are required to get talent, you definitely need to consider um, kind of your whole work-life balance beyond just the salary. But I, I don't have any other specific feedback as far as our hiring strategies on that. Sorry. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. You talked about using the design point for your de engine design, right? So you're a smaller compressor because you're running at 1.7 Mach. But when you're taking off and subsonic and all the stuff, you need that compressor pressure ratio for takeoff. How are you going to ensure that you get the enough thrust and beginning at the beginning of the takeoff? Yeah, uh, so you know, it's not a single point design, it's a, it's a compromise. Most engines are single point design. You design for um, either start of climb or top of climb for a subsonic airplane, and then you, know, you use considerably less thrust for most of your crews. So you have to think about you know, your, your peak thrust versus your peak efficiency. So you can tune your component maps uh, such that your cruise efficiency is the most efficient, but you can get more thrust elsewhere when you look at your, your peak temperatures. Um, we have similar multiple point optimization designs, so it's not truly a single optimization point. We have to look at kind of four key design points. Um, all engines operating noise compliant takeoff, or one engine inoperative takeoff, transonic, and cruise. Um, and so it is a compromise of those four points. And when you hit, right, the, the, the best design has no margin, right? Uh, if you have margin, you left performance on the table somewhere else. And so when you have four design points, it forces you to pull that margin out. So every time we, we work with our engine provider and see uh, we miss one of these four critical pinch points, it's then bring that one back into whatever you can tweak on the design, be it fan pressure ratio, bypass ratio, OPER. Um, and then the variable A8 affords some, some exciting opportunities to, to have a little bit more flexibility um, in changing some of those pressure ratios across the flight or two. So, um, Probably I was overly simplistic when I said it's a single point design. It's multiple points and it's it really, it's kind of whack-a-mole and that helps you get margin out and I think will ultimately lead to a better product. Do you, do you have room to push T4? I mean, because that's one compromise, right? You can oh man, you're getting into real detailed questions. <laughs> uh, uh, T4, uh, uh, there's a phenomenon called creep failure, which is a, so, so a lot of jet engine components have uh, they're LCF limited, low cycle fatigue, so it's the number of engine cycles that uh, lead to either crack propagation or, or component failure. Um, there's a phenomenon called creep where uh, it's a time at temperature and stress, um, and it happens in metallics where you slowly have expansion creep of the material. Um, subsonic engines don't need to worry about creep as much. It's still there, but it's rarely the mm, uh, defining the time between overhauls. Uh, because you're only operating at your peak temperatures for a small duration on takeoff. So you don't have that time at temperature challenge. We are sitting at our peak temperatures for all of crews, as are most military engines, or a lot of military engines. And so creep becomes much more limiting. So um, 
it's a trade-off when you think about pushing up T4 uh, uh, between life and how often you have to overhaul it and thermodynamic efficiency, or in this case, power out of the engine, depending on how you're using T3 and T4. No questions? Oh. <laughs> So this is one of the questions I get um, that's hard to answer sometimes. Um, but it's, you know, supersonic is going to use more energy than the equivalent subsonic. Yep. Um, the use of SAF is great. I love how you're pushing it. Um, it's going to be important for all of aviation. Um, where, where do you think you are on the, um, you know, two times, three times, four times. I yeah. see some estimates seven times from some watchdog groups that I don't particularly believe, but yeah. how much, uh, and, and, you, and then you have to weigh that against the cost and the value of time. Yep. So could you talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, great question. So um, I agree, uh, the six to eight estimates I would call flat out wrong. Uh, they use a different set of assumptions and a different aircraft model. Our, our internal estimates would put it somewhere in the two, two and a half range. Um, so this is comparing a business class seat to a business class seat. Keep in mind that a business class seat on a, on a subsonic airplane burns, takes up about four times the area of a, an economy class seat. So there is always a little bit of a, a tension there. Um, and this is, again, this, uh, that's in our 65 seat comparison to get kind of a fair business class to business class comparison. Put, pegs us right around that 2x. Um, so it is a premium product, and uh, as such, we recognize that we have a responsibility to be leaders on sustainability, which is why we've taken some very aggressive steps. Uh, we achieved carbon neutrality last year, uh, committed to net zero carbon by 2025, um, and we're, we're working that through our supply chain. So our sale to United was one of the most exciting proof points in my mind of how we're really being a force for change, because when United bought our planes last year, it was the first time that I'm aware of that uh, that, uh, that sale included a net zero operation clause. And so United said, yes, we agree, this is important, we can operate this net zero. Um, and again, when we think about a premium product, you can also think about the price insensitivity of the premium market. And so we see that as a meaningful mechanism to help get SAF to price parity, right? Because uh, an economy class passenger is going to be very sensitive to price, whereas a business class pr passenger is less so. So they can help support those SAF premiums well, the prices, well, the technology evolves and the prices decrease. And you're already seeing that with things like Saba, where you're seeing corporate travelers um, paying. Microsoft announced that they're paying up to $200 a ton of CO2 to offset their corporate travel. And so that's showing that willingness as a proof point today. Um, if you compare that with getting there in half the time, I, we think it's a very compelling combination of advancing sustainability and making the world more connected. So the supersonic flight is clearly, as you've said, a premium product. Do you guys see an economic path to that becoming, if not, you know, e e economy fair, yep. becoming more reachable for the average consumer? Absolutely. Uh, like I said, our goal is for this to be accessible to everybody. It's not going to be the first iteration. It's going to take more iterations to get there. Um, this is a big project. You can have get better economies of scale. So bigger airplanes will have better. Um, Economics, so uh, you know our next product could be twice as big, and we'd get better, better pricing. Um, the there's a lot of cost savings to be had as well. So if you're flying half the time, you're not paying your crew as much, or you, you're paying them as much, but you know they're getting twice as many flights in in that time. You're also getting twice as many more utilization when you think about your capex recovery. Um, you're able to get more flights out of the airframe when you cut times in half. Um, so we think that that that'll help get there. The other one then is when we look at e-fuels, right now fuel is the most, the, the largest expense, but we'd like to see a world where e-fuels get down below what you're paying for jet fuel today. And instead of paying $4 for jet fuel, you're paying $2 for jet fuel. And that now, uh, when you also combine that with your better CapEx payoff and your reduced uh, per flight um, crew uh, uh, costs, we think that there is a path to, uh, you know, economy class fares. Now, maybe it's 20, 30 years, we'll go through business class to premium economy to economy, but 
you see it across the board with just iteration, right? Computers used to be prohibitively expensive. You'd have one in a school or a, or a business, and now everybody has one in their pocket. So um, it just takes iterations to get those prices down. Have some for you. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank, thank you, you all for the great discussion. Appreciate the questions. That concludes our talk. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>